This is becoming a habit. That tape you brought. I'd like to hear it. Recognize the sound. I most certainly do, Mrs. Peel. Hi, everybody, and welcome again to the Intermillennium Media Project podcast. My name is Matthew Porter. I'm a Generation X dad, and with me is... Ian Porter, his millennial son, who's here to be subjected to strange and distant past media pieces. So that's what we do here. I inflict, subject, bestow, I don't know how you want to phrase it, media from my youth, from the distant time of the 20th century. We watch it again to see what I think of it and to see what Ian thinks of it coming to it fresh. And today we are going to be talking about something that is a little bit before my time. It's something that I saw when I was a kid in reruns. Reruns is what used to happen to television before Netflix and before <laughs> infomercials. <laughs> Uh, when local TV needed to fill up time, they would license syndication rights to old TV shows and play them as much as they possibly can. I can't tell if that was killed by Netflix or if that was killed earlier by cat videos, because both of those are now kind of the go-to default. We need to fill time. <laughs> That's true. I think that if uh, if local TV had had access to cat videos, they might have played a lot of them. Our current local TV does, and they do sometimes, so... It's, it's, it's the circle of life. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today is a show called The Avengers. No, not those Avengers. Oh. The original Avengers. So when they had that, the wrestler painted green to play the Hulk instead of CGI? <laughs> no, no, no. Before that. Okay, we're going back even farther. Okay. We're talking about the British <laughs> Avengers. We're talking about the reason why they had to change the name of the movie when they released the Avengers in England. Aha. Uh -huh. To Avengers Assemble. I don't know how well <laughs> that stuck, but the Avengers meant something else in Britain. It meant a really cool, stylish, secret agent TV series that ran throughout the 1960s. I will give you stylish. <laughs> You're not going to buy into the cool yet, huh? Cool is inconsistent. Cool is a little bit more segmented. There's parts of this where I was just going, what? And there are parts that were absolutely cool, but I'm not sure how much that is the whole so far. <laughs> Well, one of the, the reasons why it's hard to answer that question is that this is a series that changed so much through its history. British television producers are not uh, – they have no hesitation about letting a series change dramatically. Uh, Doctor Who, I would say, is a pretty good example of that, but not the only one. You can go to more recent shows like – uh, Midsummer Murders or Death in Paradise. You know, we have to change the cast. We have to change the location a bit. We we get more mu budget. We get less budget. They will uh, will ride with that, and they'll they'll keep the series going if it's popular in whatever way they can, or you know, and, and improve it in ways that they can if they have the resources. I absolutely agree. British TV is just so much more flexible, and that is. Odd as an American viewer because I'm used to an almost bass drum rhythm consistency to a show. E even even if the budget changes, they'll make a they'll and they make might make a deal of like oh we're moving to a new town and such. But it's usually so much more steady to see this wild of a fluctuation just from season to season is amazing. And we watched four episodes in total. We watched. Season two, episode one. We watched season three, episode one. Season three, episode four, if I've got my notes right. And then season five, episode one. So we saw the first intro to a season for different chunks of this. And it was, right. it felt like we watched three different shows mm -hmm. at times. If it wasn't for the consistent cast, and I can't even completely give season two that. But the consistent cast was the thing that kept it, oh, I'm watching this again. Right. I mean, American TV is will go with changes occasionally. You will occasionally have the Laverne and Shirley move to California. Spoiler alert, we probably are going to talk about Laverne and Shirley one of these weeks, but not to the extent <laughs> that you do in, in this British TV. 
And it's tempting to say that the one consistent thread through the Avengers is the character of John Steed. But even that isn't completely accurate. Because in the first season, John Steed wasn't the lead character. He was not the hero. He was kind of the strange second banana for a while. But most of that first season is gone. A lot of them were broadcast live. Some of them were on videotape or were kinescoped, and those recordings were lost. There are a few that are still available. There are a few that have been reconstructed. There are a few where they've turned the original scripts into audio dramas. But if you go looking for this series online or on DVD, you're going to see that it starts with uh, season two. And in some ways, season two is when the series that we know as the Avengers begins with John Steed clearly as the main character, with the pattern of it's John Steed and a female partner investigating these uh, secret agent missions. Oh, it, it, it's John Steed, the quip thrower. And the saunter into danger man with his female butt kicking companion is kind of the thing because he has a sword cane. He's got his, you know, his crack shot skills. He's skilled enough to be a field agent, but he's never the bruiser. Right. It, both in terms of the situation when the fisticuffs come out and in terms of who's dealing with things, he is almost... If it wasn't for the fact that they follow the trope of the girl gets captured and tied up somewhere, he almost feels more like the one in distress most of the time. Because when something happens to him, I think he might actually, like, bite the dust. When something happens to her, I always am certain she's going to punch someone and not be hurt. <laughs> right. We should probably back up and, yeah. and set the groundwork a little bit and maybe talk through the episodes that we've we've watched to illustrate what this series was like and how it changed over time. The basic setup is there's some British secret agent type organization. I don't know that they ever say. Do they ever say that they are working for MI6 or Her Majesty's Secret Service? Occasionally they are referred to as being – from the authorities, which is a very British way of saying that, you know, it doesn't matter what their agency is. We'd better pay attention to them. There's going to be a lot of comparisons to James Bond, and oh, yeah. I'm going to call this right here. They are better at certain pieces of base spycraft than Bond is. And the fact that as an audience, watching them go through an entire thing – we never find out who they work for right. is immediately better because it means that they will get captured, shot, killed if they went wrong. And they, of course, they, they've got another episode to be in, so it doesn't go wrong in any of these. But no one who caught them or killed them would know who they reported to. There's actually like a proper buffer of chain of command. A no, we don't know who those people are. It's actually better spycraft, and I'm yeah. impressed by that, especially for a show which was so much weirder than it had any right to be in other portions. Right. It's like Mission Impossible if the ability to disavow their, their actions is just based on a gentleman's agreement. Well, of course, I wouldn't want to bother you with this, so I will go to my death when I'm tortured by the bad guys. <laughs> it's just the sporting thing to do. Um, don't 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 call him right now. I know you have me tied up, and he's got the missile codes. But it's tea. He's sitting. He's relaxing. I think he's got his aunt over. Don't bother him. Just kill me and get on with it. So we've got in the the pattern for the Avengers is we've got these two agents. We've got John Steed and a female partner, and the female partner changes uh, throughout the series a couple of times. And John Steed is is very witty. Very stylish. It starts out, he's very much proper English gentleman. He's got his tailored suits and his bowler hat and his umbrella. And he is just the uh, the epitome of the proper English upper class gentleman. He just happens to be a, a witty secret agent. Don't really know if Steed is originally upper class or just trained really well to operate in that environment. In some ways, that ambiguity is very post-war. It's very, you know, we're not locked into our social roles unless we choose to be. We're going to rely on his super competence. Now, 
even post-war, there was, there was this idea that the super competent people are going to be the upper class. But they're very appropriately ambiguous about that from what I've seen in the adventures. He is generic in a, a way that is not negative and he's just enough of – of course he'd do that, that you start to question if it's cover. Right. There is a – like there is a fussing about your hat and then there is an amount of fussing about your hat that starts to make you question why. And part and, of that may be the fact that it's got it's steel <laughs> trim inside, which is his main hand-to-hand -hand weapon. It's a steel-trimmed hat. This this man is good guy odd job in the best way. <laughs> I I want his hat. I want his cane. I've talked before about wanting play sets of certain things. I want the John Steed Halloween costume, and I want it to, to have a reinforced hat and i wanted to have like a fake i could have a fake plastic saber in the umbrella but i want that umbrella this works it does and it's it it's on the one hand it is intended to be invisible it's just the uniform of a particular class and yet if you see someone in certain contexts dressed like that you immediately think oh john steed He's gonna say, he's gonna be very very witty and stylish and kick some ass. He's gonna be very witty and stylish and kick a portion of the ass. <laughs> yes. He will, as necessary. He, as necessary. <laughs> and when it comes to shove, I believe he will kick about thirty five percent of the ass in the room. Oh yeah. And the other sixty five percent will be handled by his female companion. That's right. So in the season two, where we started watching, his partner is a woman named uh, Kathy Gale. Right. And one thing they're really good about is they really are partners. Oh, absolutely. The, 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 the female partner is not a second banana, even though that character changes for various reasons of actor availability and the like. The female partners are capable and they are smart and they are cast and dressed and, and made up for television because they want everybody on screen yeah. to look good. But – uh, Kathy Gale is an anthropologist. She is a very capable agent, and it's it's very good to see this interplay of people who really are equals and who respect one another and who have different specialties but really enjoy working together, these characters. And we see that continue through the series. So that first season two episode that we watched, Mr. Teddy Bear. Oh, my goodness. The basic premise of this is that there are assassinations occurring. The first one occurs on screen, uh, on live television. A, a retired military person is killed with a clockwork capsule that injects cyanide into his system at a predetermined time, which happened to be the time he was about to go on the air on television. Which I got to say, as a first introduction, as a first set of scenes, I am immediately like, okay, this show has just opened with a meta TV of TV filming. I like it. And then this colonel dies on the floor. And put aside the fact that my first response is, you know, someone at craft service is getting fired My for this TV performance. <laughs> I'm immediately when – when they're like showing this little tiny capsule, I'm like – Okay, you have my attention. Your tech is thought. There is someone in your writing department who is talking with your, like, prop department into describing something reasonably. There was actually a level of, we're going to think about how this guy died, that was good. And being the early 60s, it's all analog, so it's this... Swiss jeweled clockwork mechanism that was built to uh, to time the delivery of this poison and hide inside a capsule. And one thing this series always loves is, are the gadgets. Usually, it's the bad guys who have the gadgets. This is the inverse of James Bond in that our good guy secret agents they rely on their wits and their basic equipment like his hat and sword cane. They're training their ability to move around their ability to fight and it's the bad guys who are relying upon the gadgets and i kind of like that where the I, good guys are good in and of themselves and capable in and of themselves and the bad guys have to rely on all the special gadgetry i like that too and they actually kind of reinforced that in the mr teddy bear episode because as we go along they've got to lure this assassin out somehow so the smartest and 
very clever way to do it is set up two covers of their two heroes and then have one try to hire the assassin to kill the other, which is excellent. What a way to set it up. But it's the fact that the bad guy wants to be paid in diamonds and they've got to have diamonds on hand to say we can pay you to the assassin. And the fact that they're paying that much in diamonds is Britishly, oh yes, of course. And yet when they're talking about it as a group, and it took me a bit to catch up on this for a moment until like the second conversation, but it is not an insignificant amount to them. Mm -hmm. And putting in the forms and paperwork and making sure they have the budget to fake paying this assassin (laughs) was actually important. This is spies on a government budget. Oh, that's interesting. Facing focused madmen of skills who all of their resources are going towards their evil act. That budgetary difference, it's, I've got a pocket knife, they've got a sword factory level of, I will outsmart you, is great. That's interesting. I never thought of it as a matter of resources. Maybe it's just the very casual, offhanded way that John Steed deals with everything. But I always had the impression that when it came to money, whatever agency he works for, the resources were, for practical purposes, unlimited. If he has to find 200,000 pounds to pay an assassin, they they can find that. That's not a problem. It's just that he doesn't need very much. He doesn't need fancy weapons and things. He just needs the ability to travel and stay in a decent place if it's available and, and, and have some fine dining. But it's not like he needs a huge armory or super spy tech. But may, I never hadn't thought about the limitations might be you know, budgetary, but maybe maybe he just it, knows how to work with it, that. It comes back to fussing about the hat. I'm pretty sure he can buy another hat, but he is very – he's like dusting it off and being very proper in a I don't want to have to buy another hat. I don't want to have this one damaged. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to clonk a guy on the head with the steel-rimmed hat, but then I'll – dust it off, check that it's still straight, and then put it back on my head. In a, maybe the money isn't an object, but there is a, going through the steps to get the money is not what I'm here to do and not what we're here to do. And there might be a push at which if I lost a hat every mission, I'd have a problem. It's kind a, of it's a very nice hat, and I've just got it broken in properly. <laughs> exactly. I've, I've got it broken in, and I do not want to have to break it against this man's skull. May I help you, sir? Yes, may I see some hats, please? Hey, Certainly, sir. Mr. Massey? Ah, uh, Mr. Massey will escort you. Did you find anything to suit you, sir? Thank you. I'll take 12 of these on account. Certainly, sir. So the reason that uh, first episode of season two was called Mr. Teddy Bear is that was the alias, the nom de guerre of this assassin. And this assassin is not politically motivated. He's just money Money uh, equals uh, a hit. He will kill for hire. And... That's why they are able to to hire him. You know, Kathy Gale goes out and hires him to to kill John Steed, which is a great way to set up the, the ticking clock because now she has turned started this clock ticking. And if they don't intercept and capture Mr. Teddy Bear before he fulfills this contract, he will do so, and Steed's oh. in trouble. And and they have the per- and they they don't they don't leave that un- unknown because they actually do have the fake out that he might have gotten killed. Yes. And, and of course, this leads to John Steed getting to make quips of the fact that, oh, this this picture of dead me is actually quite fetching. That's a fine <laughs> portrait you've got yes, there. Very handsome. Exactly. But yeah, yeah, Teddy Ruxpin here is is here to kill you. And I say that because he has a mechanical teddy bear, which is your point of contact. <laughs> this show could that get creepy. Awesome. <laughs> this show could definitely get creepy, and this is an example. And the gadgets didn't begin and end with the clockwork cyanide injector in this guy's medicine. As you say, he had his, the first meeting where uh, Kathy Gale is setting up this contract on Steed. She meets, quote unquote, meets Mr. Teddy Bear in a room that's like filled with shelves of doll parts. Pretty creepy Creepy. to begin with. And sitting on the desk is this teddy bear. And the assassin starts talking to her through the teddy bear. So it's totally evil Teddy Ruxpin. Oh, absolutely. This is this is evil Teddy Ruxpin. If you're a fan of the Five Nights at Freddy's series, even this one episode might be fun (laughs) just for the oh look, teddy bears are here to kill people thing. (laughs) There 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 are there are fans currently that could get into it. Oh yeah. And overall, I would say that this first 
season or the second season, first season that's available in most places. It's a good example of how they're working with this whole premise of the Avengers with relatively limited resources. It's all limited, not very extensive soundstage sets. It's very close in a camera work. It really does bring it down to the story and some very good acting, not only on the part of the leads, but on the part of the guy who plays Mr. Teddy Bear, who we get to see at the end and who is 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 a complicated character. And he's got his villain monologues, but they really are interesting. And they, they talk about the history of somebody for whom this is this is what he knows how to do. And he wants to make enough to retire. Although I got to say, season two is way too fast-paced per episode. Maybe it's just me expecting slow when I see black and white, and that that might be an issue of, in terms of what I've seen before. But my goodness, it is a mile a minute. And when you layer on top of that witty British formality, it became, I'm not parsing a scene until I'm halfway into the next there was not a moment's rest on some of these bits. Our listeners might want to stop and, and enjoy that or just think about that for a moment. I don't think they are very often going to hear you say that it was too fast-paced <laughs> when we're talking about things that were produced in the 60s and 70s. I know. But you're absolutely right. This was really sharp storytelling. They packed a lot into their one-hour uh, time, and it really moved. There were no – there's no filler, no wasted scenes. And I think that that continues through most of the Avengers. Occasionally, you'll get something where they're traveling through a tunnel, and it's like, okay, we get the idea that they're traveling through a tunnel. You don't have to show us 70 seconds of that. Well, uh, traveling is the one thing where the editing gets ridiculous in this show because there is two types of travel montage in this. There is – slow establishing shots that really want to make sure you know, yes, we've arrived here and you can get to know the environment. Or there's one that I've gotten noted here because it, res it was a direct response to what one of the characters stated. They told someone that it is 40 minutes by car. The scene that followed this, I have noted as, or 15 minutes by drug trip. <laughs> there is... A, a type of editing where it's like car, person, car, person, road, person, car, person, road in dark shadow at that breakneck pace that I don't know you're moving. I just know you exist. There is this physical force of I'm here now. Yeah, because there's no context. You can't really no. see the countryside outside <laughs> uh, on most of these shots. So it's just like, I don't know, this is looking very, very – existential like, and, so we're, we're, we're drifting through the void pursued by a motorcycle and that that was not even just in the season two episode one i saw these two types of things in the later episodes where it's it's slow or it's we're here now got it okay so it's worth taking a look at uh, season two episodes to get that that sense of what they're working with and how they're they're telling some interesting stories with those limitations but we then moved ahead to season four and season four, uh, I think, is when the series really starts to become what it is most known as, because now we're getting farther into the 1960s. It's more stylized than it was. It started out pretty stylized, but it gets more so, a little bit more divorced from realism. And yeah. season four is where we have his most icon uh, Steed's most iconic partner. Diana Rigg playing Mrs. Emma Peel. Ms. And that's, you know, that is what the Avengers is known for, is that pairing, these two characters. We've still got the very stylish and, and witty and offhand John Steed, but now we've got Mrs. Peel, played by Diana Rigg, one of the most beautiful women ever put on television in the running for the top, and just such a good actor and s such a good performer in this role that they really do work well together as actors and therefore as characters. She is at risk of being so good because she's this scientific polyglot in a, a cat suit, <laughs> fencing and also a good shot with a pistol with the strangest fighting maneuvers I've ever seen, but always winning in the, in the fight yet getting captured. You then winning 
she almost risks turning Steed into the sidekick in a not bad way. Yes, Steed may know how to handle himself in a fight, but she is the martial arts master and she is the fencer. I don't know that they ever are clear about what she's studying, but she is always studying some kind of advanced science, thermodynamics and nuclear physics. And she's obviously extremely intelligent and very restless with that intelligence. She always wants to be studying things and she'd rather be studying things and, and working on science than going off with Steed on these secret agent missions. But she knows it's necessary. So she does. As a person, she is the mile a minute that the editing used to be. And with that now concentrated into a person, the show can relax a little. And you see more of the banter between Steed and Mrs. Peel of, are they romantically connected? Are they just kind of having fun sparring? Is he really interested and she's not? And yet somehow it's never quite creepy. It's, and that's a, a, an achievement. Part of it is the time. Part absolutely. Of it is- it's never creepy, but you will need to bring a small shovel to dig through the back and forth quips to figure out the will they, won't they underneath. Yes. And I did not have enough shovel to dig here. Yeah. I'm still like, I can't tell what this is. And that's great. But they definitely work well together. How, how together that is, I don't know, but it's well together. May I have some service, please? Charming. I asked the chief predator where to find you, and he said, Ah, Mrs. Peel is in ladies' underwear. I rattled up the stairs three at a time. Mary Quip's department on the fifth floor, sir. Ah, Mrs. Peel. Our. Only been working here half a day, already enfolded the communal bosom. Find anything? Yes. None of the staff here have the faintest idea about running a store. Whatever they are, they're certainly not salesmen. Fact. Instinct. Interesting. What have you been doing? Pinters were taken over a year or so ago. Lock, stock and barrel. The whole chain of stores by Horatio Kane. King Kane? One of the original fathers of industry. So that's what they meant. I heard some of the staff talking about the king upstairs. He's here? Mm Mm-hmm. Living at the top of a building. A disused department's been converted for him. Really? Where is it? The Department of Discontinued Lines. You should fit in rather well. It's a matter of opinion. It's the top of the building, sir. Up the stairs and beyond the executive staff restaurant. Extremely civil of you, madam. Thank you. The first one that we watched, and not the first episode of uh, of season four, but the first season four episode that we watched was Death at Bargain Prices, which involved a plot by someone, or some rich industrialist who had just purchased a department store chain, and he turned the central London store into an atomic bomb. They never really explain how that happens, which is the case with a lot of the bad guy tech in the Avengers. But they kidnapped a scientist, forced him to work for them, turned the building into a bomb, turned an elevator shaft into the trigger device. And their plan was to get gone, blow up 50 miles of London, and then insist that the country just give itself over to them to rule. Or they would blow up another bomb, presumably. In some ways, they get thwarted before full plan description finishes. (laughs) Yes. But that is in part because this is conspiracy and murder wrapped up in tchotchkes for an episode. And I I loved that. There's nothing quite like a fight scene where there is way more potential weapons to hand. And there are hands to potentially weapon. So you've got fights that involve the menswear department and the hardware department and the camping and and sporting goods department. Oh, yeah. And and every place else you might possibly find either an interesting location in which to have uh, a fight or interesting props with which to have a fight. And this show is very good cinematography at people ducking behind cover. (laughs) Yes, they they very – They do that a lot. And they actually have our villains are good shots. Mm Mm-hmm. Like people who people who pick up a gun and know how to use it actually can fire at something in this show, which means ducking behind the nearest desk is important. Yes. And that's good. And it means that you get a lot of these strange low angles of like display cabinets in this episode. (laughs) And there's just like a lot of peek around a corner. I'm hiding on this side and you see the bad guy hiding on the other side of this and which one of us will leap out first 
And I didn't think you could make that interesting, but they actually made cowering behind a thing and getting your weapon ready fascinating in a in a very impressive manner. <laughs> And they really make good use of the uh, the department store as a setting overall because they have scenes in so many different places, not just because of the props and the visuals, but also that they can build dialogue and humor around that. Oh, absolutely. One of the first clues, it's, it's hidden in Department 19, and it turns out Department 19 is the cribs and – baby supplies department. <laughs> so of course, Steed and Mrs. Peel show up to look around and the salespeople immediately think that they're a couple and they're about to have, have a baby. And there's a lot of fun with that. And Steed trying to disabuse them of the fact that they're a couple right away. And Mrs. Peel just smiling and going along with it because she knows Steed's uncomfortable about it. But even at the very beginning, where before Steed and Peel get involved, there is a shootout between the two agents, one of whom works for whatever organization Steed and Peel work for. And that confrontation's in the kitty department. So the first inclination that something is wrong is when the giant yogi bear starts moving around <laughs> and then a gun appears from around. It's like, wait a minute, he's about to be killed by Hanna Barbera cartoons? It's death, then puppets and cartoons, yeah. everybody. <laughs> Might be preferable to the other way around, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah you know. But they, they have a, a lot of fun with those different locations. And, of course, Mrs. Peel goes undercover as a salesperson in the department store, and she's first assigned to the lingerie department. Of course. So, of course, we got lots of jokes about that. I feel like they've got two set dressing teams. One of them is excellent. They did the department store. They did all that. And the other one are high as anything <laughs> because the other department is the one that does things like the bad guy's waiting room that is this sparsely decorated weirdly high windows to make it claustrophobic so that's okay but like t-shaped room that has way too many corners in it and has a fire axe secret door which i just felt like great place to hide a secret le lever Awful if there's an actual fire. For the bad guys to be so competent in other things, I just thought that was a little bit too much. And I also am certain that the team that made that room made Peel's apartment the creepiest front door ever. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> See, you love that. I went, why? <laughs> why? Why is her door got a giant eyeball with lashed lid that flips up when she looks through the peephole? Yeah, when she, it's a little closed eye, and when she wants to look out the peephole, she pulls a chain on the other side of the door. The eye opens, and she can see through it. I, What's weird about that? I've played so much. Everything. No, no, I've played a lot of Legend of Zelda. My response is, I'm supposed to step back three feet, shoot it in, shoot it with my bow in the eye, and that's how you open the door. <laughs> I'm not expecting. That to be the thing people are looking out of. No, that's the lever. That's I don't the trick. Mrs. Peel would have appreciated that. <laughs> At the same time, though, she seems like the sort of person who would have a longbow and arrow on hand for oh, some reason absolutely. to be able to do so. No doubt about it. <laughs> So after uh, Death at Bargain Prices, we went back to the first episode of that fourth season, which was more of a straightforward, slightly creepy secret agent story. It was less – it was still weird, but it was a little bit less visually weird, a little bit – a little less overtly stylized than even that episode from later in the same season. It was a basic something creepy is happening in this small town. It was a small town where the, the agency has been sending agents to find out what's going on, and the agents never come back. So they sent Steed and Peel, and he's undercover as a agent for a real estate developer looking for building sites, and she is undercover supposedly as the new school teacher. And it's like a town without people. There are a few people who are trying to keep Steed and Peel away from the rest of the town so they don't know what's going on. And... Things get creepier and creep creepier just as they learn a little bit more step by step. I, I will note that this is – we watched two episodes of season four and in both of them at the very beginning, an agent of the of the whatever organization they work for died to then get Steed and Peel there. I don't know if that's consistent across all of season four, but if it is, that is very bad for the agency's turnover rate. <laughs> 
Like, if it costs you at least one agent before you get them involved every single episode, that's going to get problematic. Yeah, maybe their HR people are going to be <laughs> saying, why don't we send Steed and Peel yeah, first? first. <laughs> that episode, though, that one really kind of cemented what this felt like to me. And it's it's a strange blend between the original Italian job and the prisoner. Take those two styles and pull them out and blend them and then hand it slightly sci-fied spy mission prompts and you'll get out an Avengers episode. I realized that I was starting from a James Bond base and that was not doing me any favors. I have to approach it from that other side, that little bit more quirky side of it. And then take itself seriously instead of starting with the serious and try to quirky the thing. If you know what I mean? Once I thought that, I'm like, okay, no, this fits exactly. And it can take itself as seriously as ever wants at that point. Because that that background radiation of quirky weirdness is steady. And you're absolutely right about the, the resonance with the prisoner, especially <laughs> in that episode about the town. What was that called? I think it was called something like the the town, the town of no of never, return. Uh, the uh, okay, the town of no return. Yeah, town of no return. The it's, idea of this creepy coastal town where you're really not sure what's happening and you're really not sure who's on the level and who isn't. It, it starts out with a the first scenes of that is a guy on the beach watching as a rather pointy black bag comes up from the sea to the coastline. It is Rover's cousin. It is Rover's angular, dark cousin right. instead of this round white ball. Almost shot for shot in some ways. Yeah, and it comes up out of the surf and then opens up and a man steps out of it. And I gather he was one of the prior agents. And um, the fact that he was dressed similar to the way Steed is does kind of give credence to the fact that that's the uniform. I, was, I wasn't really sure. Is he one of the infiltrators or was he one of the agents? It works either way. Hmm. And that was the, the bad guy's plot in this one. It really was relatively low tech. There weren't a lot of super science gadgets from no, the bad yeah, this guys was, in this one. This Basically, one was it was some indeterminate enemy power. And remember, this is you know, back in the, the 60s, so we're talking general Cold War era. Some indeterminate enemy power was using submarines to land people on the English coast to essentially take over small towns, do away with their their populations and take them over – to give themselves a foothold where they could take advantage of underground bases like bunkers from the Second World War and use that as a launching point for taking over the rest of England with these armies that they're they're landing and hiding. Not very sensible, if you ask me, a few problems with that plan, but at least it was straightforward and it didn't re require super science. It was the cleanest of the plans in that sense, but the fact that it didn't get as creative – I think made its villains less interesting. Yeah. I've got kind of a, an overall picture of what a villain for this show was based on the next episode. I'm going to get to that, but there's a baseline that that one didn't hit in terms of who they're fighting this time. Right. And it still had a lot of the fun things with all the interplay between Steed and Peel. It had the, the wonderfully surreal scene in the train on the way where John Steed has this bag of holding and he keeps pulling things out of this bag. He's pulling out a whole tea set, including the multi-tiered tray of marzipan treats and a steaming teapot. Oh, absolutely. Whistles and steam comes out and he reaches into his bag and pulls out this, this teapot. Th that moment, what in the world? That's one of those times where they just started to have fun with it. In that quirky level, but it's like, I don't, I can't, I can't laugh at this because I don't know if you're Chekhov's gunning that he has boiling water at all times. And I could believe that you're about to try to do that. This show actually took itself so seriously, I felt I also had to. I like the fact that they never seem to do that, though. They they add one of these bizarre things near the beginning. It's never really that contrived. It's never – we need some way for him to get out of a trap at the end. So we're going to throw in at the beginning that he has this ridiculous thing on his person. No, it's just he <laughs> lives in a weird universe and he's got a bag full of teapots or something. 
he doesn't need the teapots for anything except making tea, but that's the kind of guy he is. He's got it. I like the fact that it's never that kind of, well, we need this, so we better go back and put it in. It's not contrived in that way. I love it. I I can understand that it's it's still just – I can see why you expect that to be the case, and I love the fact that they subvert that. They subvert that. I wonder if I watched more than we did of this series, if the fact that they kept subverting that – would eventually break me as an audience from like expecting that anymore. And if that would be a detriment, maybe we watched just the right amount of episodes for me to keep that suspension. Maybe I'm not sure on that part. So after that one, after season, uh, those couple of season four episodes, we went up to season five and that's when it's the Avengers in, in color. <laughs> yes. And they make a, make, make a point of, of telling you that. And even in that one season jump from four to five, it gets even more stylized. It gets even more of that swinging 60s, cool Britannia mod sort of feel. But it gets that much weirder. Show. It does get weirder. It's still the same show. It's still Steed and Mrs. Peel. And again, great pairing of characters, great pairing of actors. It's the same show, but more so when you get to season five. Absolutely. And this this one, season five, episode one, it's from Venus with Love. So they're 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 just playing with the names in some ways at this point, too. But they are they're getting weirder because it's this br the British Venus Society's members are being killed off as they're watching the planet Venus in like telescopes and such by a flash of light that turns all their hair white and kills them instantly in all sorts of strange environments. It's it, and whatever is killing them is boiling water in the area. It's weird. It's a little bit more unknown what the threat is for a long while. Yeah, this is definitely the uh, the UFO death ray episode. There is, it seems like oh, is, is Venus looking back and is trying to stop us from invading? Yeah, because that's one of the things this British Venusian Society wants is a private space program because they don't want a space program that focuses on the moon. They want a space program that focuses on Venus because Venus is where we're more likely to find life for some reason that I'm not sure about. Unexplained yeah. hippiness. Yes, you still get the craziness of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, this gentleman has locked himself in his vault and will be in there till three o'clock because he's looking at his artwork. And, of course, the thing kills him in the vault, so it's a locked room mystery for a second before they point out the melted hole in the wall. Things like that. But at the same time, it, they, they'll, like, pause and take a look at the fact that his, like, death shadow is on the painting he was looking at. Yes. That sort of background, like... Yes, a man is dead and kind of uh, with his bleached white hair. We've got, you know, dead Colonel Sanders on the floor here. But they'll take the time to notice what it did to the artwork. Yeah, there's there's no sense of solemnity on the part of Steed or Peel about death. I mean, they'll pause and they'll feel bad about it, but it's not going to slow them down if they pick no, a yeah. clever line that they <laughs> want to deliver. They and their surroundings are taking death in stride as just part of the job. And you know, maybe that's how – Secret agents from an indeterminate government agency deal with the fact that they're always being called out when people are killed is, well, it's another chance for a joke. I guess so. Yeah, it's it's dismissive, but not cold is the best way I can describe that then, the way they approach death. And we get a wide cast of colorful dead characters here. Mm -hmm. Like it is it is the first two guys are not that interesting. But we get to know three people who then in quick succession are shot down right one after another. Mm -hmm. But it's like, oh, it's the very formal chimney sweep dead. It's, 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 you know, guy in his safe dead. It's you know, ASMR war flashbacks, man, dead. <laughs> that background level of quirky is everywhere. It's not just following these two main characters. That's just their world. Yes. And with season five being that a little more so. Everyone else is a little more so, and that works. It keeps it consistent, even though you are going, wait, what? You're glued to the, the show, but you're confused because the world is not what you're used to, but it's consistent enough for you to stick with it. Right, and Steed and Peel are always amused not only by being that kind of person, but by living in that kind of world. She meets a chimney sweep who is a member of the British Venusian Society, and his name is Bertram Fortescue Winthrop Smythe, 
which he had to change to Bertie Smith because no one would take him seriously as a chimney sweep with a name like Bertram Fortescue Winthrop Smythe. Who would ever want their chimney swept by a Winthrop Smythe? But he's a fun character and he talks like an upper class uh, Englishman. But he's there in his top hat and and soot covered clothes because he's a chimney sweep. It's what he does and he's proud of it. There's something very just happy about it. And you could – I could see another show milking these characters, taking these weird people and stretching it out. But this show is just like, you're here. Hello. Goodbye. (laughs) And Mrs. Peel is delighted to meet him. Absolutely. She's she's fascinated by this this person who's very pleasant and is enthusiastic and knowledgeable about what he does. It's it's a great little interaction for a scene that isn't necessary to drive the plot forward. It's a wonderful scene in that episode. In that one scene, they had enough back and forth, enough chemistry, that I'd wished we'd gotten to see Steed come in. Other shows, current, you know, mystery, murder, drama things, would have had that character following around for half an episode to increase the will-they-won't-they they tension between our male and female leads because she is so back and forth and chatting with this other guy and they would have milked a character with that much personality for a lot longer but no he's he's almost establishing shot in terms of narrative use in the most delightful and in some ways the most unexpected ways and you see that kind of scene recurring where one of them has this Fun little interaction with some really background character. But again, it helps establish that world. And in general, there are certain kinds of scenes that are always going to show up in one of these. It seems like there's always a scene where Mrs. Peel winds up tied up by the bad guys. There's always a scene in which Mrs. Peel winds up using her kung fu skills against the bad guys and succeeding. Is that what those were? (laughs) Of course they were. That... (laughs) That was dance fighting. It, it was. This it was, was this that that was dance fighting. She had weaponized snapping that disarmed a guy with a gun in one point. She had these wildly weird spinning kick things. It was effective, but I don't know of what martial art that was. You are right. That was dance fighting. <laughs> and wasn't the best fight choreography or it's never the best fight choreography in this show, but the filming of it helps make up for that somewhat. They do love Dutch angles and lots of weird cinematography in this show to make things look stranger and creepier. And they definitely have learned how to make the most of a little bit when it comes to filming those fights. One other kind of scene that you see fairly frequently in this show that most TV shows aren't confident enough to pull off are long stretches with no dialogue. Yeah, it had a good amount of silence. Usually at some point in one of these stories, Steed and Peel are working separately, following up separate clues, and we follow one or the other of them as they investigate something. And because there's no one for them to talk to, it's just them investigating and there's no dialogue. But these actors are so expressive that you can see them discovering things. You can see them thinking about things you you can't take your eyes off them because it's interesting to see them exploring and investigating great scene with mrs peel in the the venus episode has her looking around I forget whether it was a barn or an old house or something and it it could have been a boring scene but she just held your attention by being this character and you get to see her discover and and think about things there's a trust from the directors and there's a confidence in themselves in the actors to hold that scene for long enough you've got to be able to have grabbed the audience's attention to start and then keep it going and more media needs to do that nowadays it's not something that you see as often right i mean imagine if You see, it doesn't work in a podcast. You can't just have me drink coffee for a moment in the middle of it. But imagine if some of our other shows would allow the actors to set a scene themselves. You'd not only have a lot more interesting moments with the actors, but you'd probably save on helicopter shots of the city. Right. In terms of cost. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot that the acting can sell when the, the production doesn't have the resources to make it fancier and makes for better television in a lot of ways. And I like the way that that Venus episode wraps up in that we've got this bizarre 
organization, the British Venusian Society, and the leader is this Mrs. Venus who's reading people's auras, talking about life on Venus, and it's a very select membership and a very high membership fee and all this. And all along, I'm thinking, okay, this is you know the, the Scientology meets the real aliens meets Elon Musk, and they want to have their private space program. They must be the bad guys. And they're really not. They're not. They uh, are spoiler alert. Crazy. They're the good guys. They're, 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 they're not the, vic- the victims in this one. They're not the bad guys. Right. No, they hired the bad guy. They are sincere. Maybe they're crazy, but they're sincere. The bad guy is an eye doctor, and his beef is that there's this charitable foundation that has taken money away from his medical research and put that money towards the British Venusian Society, which you know, may be a questionable choice i kind of like medical research personally yeah, yeah. but investment um, questions but he is so angry about that he becomes a member kind of infiltrates the society and then supercharges a surgical laser to start zapping members to try to get the organization to collapse so the money can come back to his research uh, look at the the just from the episodes we watched we've got a mechanical genius who happens to go for a stuffed animal aesthetic. We've got a a shop run by people who develop it into a nuclear bomb, but also run a department store that has a very clear and at least trackable system of if we don't have it in stock, we will find a provider and order it for you. With Because that's one of the clues to the entire story is this product that they've got a lot of in stock just because one guy ordered it. But none of the other employees are confused, which tells me that an ordering system like that is part of their system. They're actually running some decent customer service there. This eye doctor is, I mean, Coke bottle glasses that are like a six pack of Coke bottoms stacked together. And he he looks crazy. He does a hat eye chart, which actually was good spy craft. Like being able to recognize what a guy was wearing from a long distance is pretty good if you need to find a suspect. So... I was actually decent, but it's still weird. It's organized kooks of supervillains. They are all, though, smart and organized people. It's like the seven steps of highly effective villains. It's not a negative to be the genius or the brute in this. Everyone is smart in this show. Everyone gets to be smart. The bad guys just get to be misdirected. And they're not outright crazier than everyone else. They're not outright smarter than everyone else. They're just doing something bad. In general, I would say that when they move to color and they have a bit more of a budget, it's still the same show. It gets to be more of what it was. Oh, yeah. The one exception is I'm not crazy about some of the wardrobe changes when they go to color. For example, in this first color episode, uh, at one point, Steed is in this what looks like a red silk suit or something. It just did not seem to fit in that sense. I mean, it was tailored nicely. It didn't, it seemed a little bit too wacky and mod for the kind of character that John Steed had been, who was never a fuddy-duddy, but that was just not very stylish. For, for him to be okay wearing that and then bothered at the very end of the episode when his hat, his precious hat, gets blasted by the laser and made pure white seemed odd because, no, no you can't wear that suit. And then be this bothered by a hat that pristine still. Just because it's white now, you're fine. Peel understood that and was all for it. But the fact that he was bothered and yet was seen in that earlier, no. So I think that we're probably going to wind up watching some more of the Avengers, both some of the older episodes, maybe some of the newer episodes. But it has a lot to recommend it. Yeah, we're going to have to space it out. Yes. That's not a show to watch... uh, Mm. Oh, we're getting into the final responses there, so yeah. let, let, let's go to let's go to the the full track of this and get this that right. That's right. So it is time for our final ratings, and the first one of those is binge or no binge. Is this a show you should seek out and watch as much of as you can? So what do you think, Ian? Having seen this now for the first time, binge or no binge for the Avengers? I'm going to call it a binge, but I'm going to put an asterisk on it. I'm going to say binge in like drip. This is this is like a morphine drip in the hospital. They don't just all put it into you at once. They put you on a regulated amount in doses as it goes. 
you should sit down and watch like two episodes of the Avengers at a time and then come back to it a little because I don't think you should – if you watch too much of it once, I'm worried that you're going to get used to it in a way and that delightful oddity will just become plain at which point – there's things still definitely to recommend it, but you're losing a part of the experience from what I, I saw of it. I don't want you to burn out on that section of it. That's interesting. That is very similar to what you said about Max Headroom. That it was oh, binge, but binge in small doses. Absolutely. And I really don't know what will happen to you if you were to alternate. If you were to watch like two episodes of The Avengers and then two episodes of Max Headroom and then two episodes <laughs> of The Avengers for a day, I do not know what that would do to you. Please consult your doctor before attempting. You know, there are different senses of humor, but I think that uh, Max Headroom might get along okay with John Steed and Mrs. Peel. <laughs> I'll let you think about yeah, that. Yeah, I'm just going to have to think about this for a while. I'm uncertain. Now, I think that I would definitely say binge. I think this is a great show. I think that it builds upon itself very well. I would say that binge, the only warning I would provide is recognize that because of the way it changed over time, you really can think of it as several different shows. Watch an episode or two from those first few seasons, first season or two, and see if you enjoy them. If you do, there are some great stories in there, so go ahead and watch them. If the visuals, the style, the pacing of that, say, that that second official season, the first season you'll be able to get your hands on, don't appeal to you, but there's something in there that you like, jump ahead to season four and see some of the later episodes with Mrs. Peel and more of what the show was remembered as. And if you're still not crazy about it, watch an episode from season five or six when it was in color because you may find a starting place that's better for you. So it, since it really does come across – in some ways, as a few different series. Yeah, it, it's hard because it is so so separate, but there is enough of a through line to definitely call it one show. Right. If you do enjoy the, the, the early seasons, start watching there and you can follow it all the way through. In some ways, the fact that they, they had enough of a jump to make us question that and one more bit of information make our, our second point of, of review hard to do. And I'm going to tell this part now is the fact that this did get a continuation. This did. did get a reprise. Right. The new Avengers came out. This show ended in 1969 in America. No, 1969 in both the United States and London. It was almost, it was very simultaneous. Yeah. Like as it became more popular, they started essentially showing them at the same time uh, in, uh, in the UK and in other parts of the world, including North America. But there was a series, the new Avengers, that was through 1976 to 1977, much shorter, but it was a continuation with the same guy as Steed again. But Steed wasn't the lead character as in the same way, was he? I take it was a little bit more Charlie's Angels and him being a Charlie role based on the on the the review. That's the impression the bit of read I'm getting. So but it's kind of the Charlie's Angels or Mod Squad version of the of the avengers and i don't know that it was particularly popular and i mean it only lasted last very long it didn't last very long it lasted 22 episodes and that's right. it yeah so one solid season but you know and i have not seen any of that maybe it's pretty good but i haven't really if it doesn't have steed and his partner such as mrs peel as the focus it didn't seem like the avengers to me so it never attracted me to uh to watch that but before we get ahead of ourselves let's introduce the second part of our ratings and that is reboot, revive, or rest in peace. Revive would mean let's bring it back with the same characters, the same continuity, kind of like we've seen with the X-Files or Twin Peaks or other things that are brought back after a while. I suppose Gilmore Girls, that's a revive. Yeah, it does. Reboot is let's start it again. Let's reimagine it. Let's let's take the same concepts and the same characters and start afresh with a new sensibility. That would be, for example, your Battlestar Galactica. That's a reboot. Different actors, different directors, different style, but going back to the same source material. And then there's Rest in Peace. This had its time. It was good or bad for whatever it was, whenever it was, but let's not try to do anything with it again. So what do you think for the Avengers? What would you like to see happen with the Avengers? I want to see this rebooted. I do want to you? see this come back. And the part of the problem is that whether or not it can come back as the Avengers is a little difficult, actually. They had to change the name of the the movie when it came to Britain. 
and it came to the the UK, but the Marvel movie, the Marvel movie. But that I think also means that that name got claimed. So maybe they could bring it back and a reboot also lets you rename the show. But I want to see uh, a side note. Once like, like the Marvel thing, what are they avenging? Yes. I don't the, know the, they, the, well, the name is there. It's a cool name, but there's nothing specific on that. Oh, yes, there is. Almost every episode starts with some other poor agent having died. So they're just – they are the Avengers for this organization from the authorities. They go in and, and they get the guys who killed one of their colleagues, and somehow they don't run out of colleagues. So maybe they are avenging something. Maybe that's why they don't say what part – what department, <laughs> yeah. what, where they're from, because when they point out that they're actually with HR – <laughs> it gets awkward. Yes. It's like we're the best agents in the business and HR has us because we're here like checking how other guys died. I mean, that actually gives a credence to it. I can I can appreciate that. OK, maybe that means they get the name and uh, Marvel has to go change it. Yeah. But I want to see this show rebooted. It's got a fun back and forth. It is archetypical in how to do a pair of leads in that way. It does it so well. And I think we could see that again. I think that it's level of everyone's weird and everyone's smart. And that means that there are bad guys and good guys, but the good guys have to use theirs a little differently and win could definitely still play. I think I have to disagree with you on this one. My response to this one is rest in peace. Oh, my. It was a product of its time. It was perfectly suited to its time. It was an outgrowth of the culture. And... A reboot was attempted. There was a movie. Wait a minute. The Avengers. Not the Marvel movie. This is the movie that was released. It was released in 1998. Wait a minute. It starred Ray Fiennes and Uma Thurman as Steed and Peel. And it got a whopping 5% on Rotten Tomatoes. I have never seen this. Nothing has ever made me interested in seeing it. I've never been that angry at myself to sit myself down to watch it. Is this where that gif of the guy punching the guy in the teddy bear suit comes from? Quite possibly. I don't know. Oh, no. That means they took season two, episode one as their base, didn't they? Oh, did they? That could be. I could think be they did. Teddy Ruxpin in color. Oh, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, they attempted a reboot. It did not work well. <laughs> I don't know that this really would translate – culturally without being such a period piece it would seem frozen okay so i i i offer a question then is it possible on our show here to suggest tangential reboot well, can you can you bring a series back and, I, and that's that's somewhere in between the reboot and the and the revive can you bring a maybe maybe let me change my my word then i want to revive set now then Oh, I want, would meet the same characters and the same actors. See, that's where I'm wondering. I want to see the world these one, these guys live in. I want to see the world where this show, baseline worldview, oh. if, was there. You want to see the agency they work for in the 21st century, and they can have pictures of John Steed and Emma Peel on the wall as some of their you know, Hall of Fame agents. But this is about a new set of people – fulfilling the same role in the modern world. Absolutely. I mean, you've got you've got you've got modern day shows really wanting a larger overarching story. Give us a show about the upstart in in this agency who is making his way through. Make the big twist the fact that he's going by a fake last name and his real last name is Steed and he doesn't want his father's legacy to get him an easy oh, go. Okay. Give us a story where this world of clever quirkiness is still the way to save the day in that sense. And I could definitely see it work. If, if the fact that they tried to re reboot it failed, that doesn't mean this is tapped out. And that's where I'm looking at. Well, it sounds like what you want is a, a, a next generation revival. Yeah. Which seems to me to be a lot like what they tried to do with the new Avengers. Now they tried to do it back then. There were issues with seventies television in general, if you ask yeah. me and what, what people were trying to write for. Maybe they could try this again in the twenty first century with more distance without being as connected to the old show. I still don't see a need for it, but I could see that working in a way that the earlier revival didn't really work in the way the reboot obviously <laughs> didn't work. Yeah, now that you point out what it is, uh, I'm reading the reviews. But I also would say you don't need to reboot this. Because the culture already has. 
Okay. This is a formula. This witty, confident, competent people working together, usually a man and a woman as partners. This is a pattern that I'm sure has you, you've seen before the Avengers and you've definitely seen after the Avengers. Remington Steel is in its way a reboot of the Avengers. Like Moonlighting is in its way a reboot of the Avengers. And these might not mean a lot to you, Ian, because I haven't subjected you to these yet, but I will. I'm taking notes. Um, in a lot of ways, that partnership of extremely competent and intelligent and witty man and woman with that will they or won't they tension and strange and interesting world in which to have adventures. That's already been redone. Castle. Every, Castle is another example. <laughs> Every generation gets its version of this, okay. and I think it always will. So I think we've already seen a lot of Avengers reboots in that sense, that general sense, and I think we always will. Okay, I, I can I can understand that, and I'm I'm okay with giving this a rest in peace then as well. If we want to make that consistent. It's a hard one to pin down in that sense. Mm -hmm. It's a hard one to let go because it is so fun. Oh yeah, you don't want it to have been this. Thing trapped in the past, and yet it is of its time in so many ways. I still want his hat. Great hats. Very good hat. And he bought twelve of them at a time at the in the department store episode. Yeah, I uh, don't know that those had the uh, the steel rims. Yeah, though. is he is he putting those in himself? <laughs> I don't know. Is, or is he is he putting those in himself? Does the agency have a guy they send them to? Yeah, they don't have a Q branch, but they have a good haberdasher. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you, everybody, for joining us for another Intermillennium Media Project podcast. If you want to reach us, you can reach me at MatthewFPorter.com, or you can reach me on Twitter at ByMatthewPorter. And Ian, where can people find you? I am at ItemCrafting.com, or I am ItemCrafting on Twitter. And for the podcast, you can also reach us at IMMPCast on Twitter. Thank you again, everybody, and we will be back soon. And until then, go find something new to watch.